Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I did not think this. Well, um, how many people have seen the movie tonight? Or the uh, not the movie tonight, but the uh, Charles B. Pierce Town of Dread Okay, so some of you guys know what I'm doing. I saw this film several months ago, and as a fan of slasher films, who has been a bit frustrated lately with how I, f I find how kind of rote and um, uninspired slasher films have been in, of, of late. I feel, I feel like it used to be a genre where filmmakers could take the material and really have fun and play around and uh, create uh, an own, their own visual identity. And that's absolutely what Alfonso Gomez Rajon has done with this film. I'm super humbled and excited to introduce to you Mr. Alfonso Gomez Rajon. Who has his own microphone? Hello? Hi. So, um, before we get started, I thought it'd be great if you could set up the movie a little bit. Because it's not a conventional, it's not a film, we were discussing this earlier, not an easy film to pigeonhole. It's a slasher, but it's a slasher that has a relationship with an earlier film, but it's not a remake, and it's not necessarily just a straight sequel. Um, I don't think I can do better than that, because it's as, it's as difficult to describe it, which I think was what was so exciting about uh, making the movie, because it was hard to put in a box. It was a slasher movie that I wanted to make that reminded me of the ones I grew up with, uh, when we really felt the filmmaker. And uh, it was also a movie that celebrated movies in a weird way, because it was a movie that, that um, haunted a town, and, 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 and kind of froze it in time, and I liked that idea. But it's a movie, it's its own story that just happens to be uh, inspired by the original movie, which is, uh, which is kind of the thing that uh, froze the movie, the, the, the city in time, fictionalized the pain because the real movie is based on real murders that happened in 1946, and it's also the reason that the girl um, uh, may or may not become a, a person of her time. Okay, Alfonso, you also have some friends, I believe? Yeah, I have a few friends who wanted to say hi to you. Oh my god. Oh boy. <laughs> Just like, uh, they're the fa we have our own regular group of phantoms. Let's give it up to theatrics and their incredible phantom outfits. <laughs> give the photographer too. After reading it, I, I liked uh, the idea of the, uh, of the, it reminded me of the films that I, of the slashers that I grew up with. They're quite character driven often. And um, I liked her character. I think uh, she was, uh, you know, had these uh, very twisted past and, now, uh, past, and now that she's about to start to feel again, it all goes to shit again. Um, I like the duality of the town of, from a border town on the Texas and Mexican border, so I like that and exploring the two textures and two personalities of that and the duality of everything. And, and I thought, and, and I was a big fan of The Last Picture Show and a lot of photographers like Stephen Shore and Mike Leesman and a lot of the Joel Sternberg, all these guys, and I thought, well, that might be an interesting, I may have, I mean, and then obviously the, what I said earlier about the, the power of movies and how a movie defined a town. It's a stretch, obviously, but I like that way into a film and how that would uh, kind of inform everything else, even the way the body is and the tracks is actually the anatomy of a murder saw bass. But, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, there's, and, there's, and there's there's zoetropes and the, the, the train yeah, image. I, I put together a, a very uh, detailed lookbook that, that the studio had and Ryan and everybody had. I don't know if they saw it or not, but I was certainly I was very clear of how I wanted to tell the story, and and uh, and then that you know once there, we had a room in Shre we shot in Shreveport and in Texarkana, we had a room in the office and it was like the gallery we called it because it was just wall to wall photography and every department would then put things and join things and every every color and forms in other departments so it was really a wonderful group effort because everyone started feeding off those original ideas. Um, it's just quite clear. Uh, the, what the approach is going to be, and the time that we have, which is very little. And my DP, Michael Goy, who's done a lot of uh, stuff with me, uh, just gets me. We have a shorthand, so he knew, he knows exactly how to pull off some very classical coverage, you know, but it's just the, and the colors. And, and I don't know if I really achieved what I wanted to achieve, but it was all about where is the sun today? Where is the sun in this scene? How does that inform the, the shadows and how they stretch and how they move? and, and uh, and, and she had a certain palette, and, and as did everybody else. And so as long as, you know, the, 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 
Dennis O'Hara's room is blue in this and that, and everyone had, everyone had their palette. I, I, I would have to go into detail to remember which exactly, but everyone had a palette, so that would inform the color, and, and obviously um, wanted to crush the reds and, and, and have the red in the beginning mean something, and, and, and he connected visually. I mean, there's, certainly there's a quick flashback when, when uh, Travis Hope makes a move on her in the car, and you flash back to, to the opening scene in the car when they start making out. So those colors had to be quite specific, so that when they, you intercut them, your memory, you know, it, you got. I mean, he's influences everything. Uh, so you were, you were March for Yeah, 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 years ago, years ago. And so he's always, his films always inspired me to make movies when I saw Mean Streets and, uh, and everything I do. You got a Boxcar Bertha uh, yes. reference. Right. Yes, it was. A, we, we had a talk once about was this the right thing for me to do for the first one, and and, um, and, uh, and he was very encouraging about embracing the genre and going all in, and and uh, so of course it was a box for birth of reference. So I had to be you know planned out way in pre-production. You have to get all those things cleared, but I always knew that at the end, even even the town hall would look would be an old theater palace, and at the end the double feature would be with boxcar. Um, as a nod to him. Yeah. Did he have any input? Has he seen the film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a very specific sound notes. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, no, he, you know, he, he, was, he, he really loved the style of it. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. It was a my 60 millimeter print of the film that we projected, but you couldn't really see. So we had to do that in the uh, VFX that later. Uh, but yeah, it was a very um, quite simple idea, but how to do it with no not many resources. But it was as simple as. Uh, a crane, old old crane with a basket, with a steady cam guy that would go over the screen, and and while he was uh, weaving through the cars and introducing Dennis O'Hare and or the two boys and everybody uh, at Herman, then the 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 crane would literally we couldn't get track that long, so it was just uh, wooden boards, very noisy, so all that had to be looped, and it would just. They would push the crane to the other side of the of the, the parking lot, and then just in time for you know it had to be you know time so that the car pulls up at the same time, and just in time for the Steadicam operator to get back on the basket and go up to the. A lot of takes, or how many times? Yeah, yeah. I mean, was, not not a crazy amount of takes, but it was like 13 takes. I mean, it's a very uh, yeah, it's but but it was great fun. I mean, every day was a lot of fun because every day was a challenge, and the horror films always were so much fun to do. Did that? Come to you when you saw when you read the script. You knew you wanted the movie to kind of start like that. Or no, originally I wanted to start with this huge, incredibly pretentious day for night reference, which is <laughs> the opening documentary stuff was going to be a whole thing of of seeing being in Texarkana and seeing Charles B. Pierce shoot uh, a scene from his movie. So I was trying to match the extras that he had. It was a big deal, but we had no time for it. It became this this documentary thing that I think actually it was much more effective. And uh, so that's how I originally wanted to start it. But, um, but I knew, I, I pretty clearly knew that I wanted to do this, this long take at the beginning. And, and so right from uh, the second we, we all arrived to Shreveport, we tried to figure out how to do it. It was on a research trip there that the sheriff said, told me that, uh, that Charles Pierce, Pierce's son was still alive and living in the city. And then that, then, then we wrote a character. Oh wow! So that was an, that was a no, that no. came out of uh, yeah. It was very production. it was a really wonderful. Uh, it, no, all that stuff was, was a lot of that material was in a different scene with a different kind of crazy woman. But then after we realized that Charles Lee Pierce's son is actually in the city, it was it wasn't like we were trying to be meta. This thing was just kind of like telling us like the sun is here now. I have to see the sun. So you have to you have to track him down, which is not easy because like they said, like he's got jobs and his phone is off, and you find, eventually get them, and then. And a lot of some of those lines about uh, about his dad, oh, it, it, the idea that he was there talking about his dad and, and the movie to find him, and uh, and he stayed in Texarkana. It was really fascinating, you know, bittersweet, but a very human life story that he had. And that he's in the film, he has a, a couple of cameos. But, uh, and then, so that then informed the Dennis O'Hara character. And I think made the film richer because of that. Absolutely.